All right. Well, friends, we are in uh, the book of Ephesians. And uh, so as we, as we move into this, um, I'm going to try something today. And um, I'm normally very comfortable um, in, in teaching. I love it. It's my favorite thing to do in ministry. But um, I'm nervous today. My hands feel like they're about four degrees. I feel like I could throw up, which is always encouraging. Because I want you to know, like, there, something, I think something's going on today. I think a number of our, our praise team members were awake at 2 a.m., couldn't sleep last night. My wife was one of them. And, and there's just this thing going. And I, I want to be very clear. We're going to talk about something of God today that is vitally important for the church to understand. But the reason it's important is because it's not only true of God, but it should comfort us in our finite, limited understanding. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to start off today talking to you from a story that I love. You know, if you've been here before, that I love C.S. Lewis. He's the writer of the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote Mere Christianity, The Problem of Pain, a number of other books, uh, Miracles, just phenomenal. I mean, this guy was as smart as it gets. He was a, he was a scholar at Oxford and the Cambridge University um, uh, professor of English. So he and J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, would sit in the, the, the pub they called The Bird and the Baby, and they would critique each other's work. Can you imagine being in the horsepower of that much smart? And uh, they sat together, and they would critique this. And I want you to, to uh, join me. When, remember when you were little, and everything could become like imagination? I remember, and this is kind of gross, but in, in our house, we had this tile on the floor in front of the, the, the loo, if you're British, or the bathroom in the, in the toilet. And when I was little, I would look on there, because you could see where I was sitting, and, um, and I would see these characters kind of etched into the tiles, and I would imagine them battling. So maybe I was there too long. But uh, the reality was, like, I was so imaginative, okay? So I want you to join me. If you're older and you've not been imaginative, I want you to join me, because there is a world. And it was found by a little girl playing hide-and-seek with her older brother, her older brothers and her sister, Susan. It started as hide-and-go-seek. And they were hiding and playing in this old English manner. She crawls into a wardrobe. And what happens is the fur coats stop feeling like fur. They start feeling like prickly pine needles. And the hardwood floor of the wardrobe begins to crunch like snow under her feet. She looks out into the darkness of this wardrobe and sees a lamppost. Intrigued, she walks forward. Under the lamppost, she meets the most interesting little creature. He's a fawn, and his name is Mr. Tumnus. And Mr. Tumnus takes the time to unfold to her the mystery of this land she stumbled into and found. It's called Narnia. And it's bound under an evil magic that is held by the the evil queen, the white witch. And she does everything she can to control this land to know all she can, so she has spies. She uses the trees and the birds and the other creatures of Narnia to gather information to her so that she can know what's going on in her land and if there's any threats that would seek to unseat her. Unbeknownst to little Lucy who wandered first into the wardrobe, her brother Edmund also came, but he wasn't so fortunate. Instead of meeting Tumnus, he bumped into the white witch herself. She tricked him. She gave him an enchanted drink and food, and instantly he was addicted to it. He just wanted more of this sweet, wonderful food that she had given him. And he was bound to her because she knew that his identity mattered. The queen, unable to know everything, was always seeking to gather information, always trying to find out what the plan was to unseat her because she knew that she must protect her rule. See, Edmund, this brother, was the key to trapping the creator of Narnia, the lion, the great lion, Aslan. He had long been absent, and his return was imminent. She was preparing for war, and she knew Edmund held the key. She knew that Aslan would do anything within his power to save a daughter of Eve or a son of Adam. Now, the time came when all four siblings, 
entered into Narnia through that same wardrobe. And they came into Narnia, and the treachery of, Ad of Edmund was not yet known. His siblings hadn't known that he had met the White Witch. They were taken in by this strange little family of beavers. And at dinner one night, the treachery of Ed Edmund was revealed. Edmund snuck off during the meal. And the beavers knew at once he had been deceived by the queen. He went to betray them. Off he went into the snow. Between the two mountains, her castle set, and he was on foot. Because the queen had kept the land Narnia ever in winter and never Christmas. Off through the snow he went. The beavers gathered the children and said, we must get to the camp. It was called Aslan's How. We must get there and build the war camp with them, for the time has come. Off through the snow they went, but something was happening. The snow, which was once so crunchy and hard, was loosening. It was slush now. And they were marching through the slush, getting to Aslan's How. But Edmund had also reached the queen, and he found her completely different than she had promised. She was hateful and trickery and, and just malicious. She bound him and forced him to walk in the slush and snow behind her sleigh. See, she knew that it was important that this young man be used to the fullest extent to defeat Aslan. Aslan was home. Aslan gets to this point where he enters into a negotiation with the White Witch. She is going to use Edmund to her advantage. So the Great Lion and the Evil Witch stand together in a hushed conversation why Edmund looks on sheepishly wondering what's going to become of me. See, he's bound to her. She owns him. The lion walks back and the queen leaves camp with a little bit of a smile on her face and a glint in her eye, thinking she's won the negotiation. Aslan tells Edmund, you are free. He restores Edmund to his brothers and sisters and puts him into his war, into his camp. He fully restores the young man. Later that night, Aslan leaves the camp under the cover of darkness, this great lion walking quietly, big paws on soft grass, out into the darkness. The two sisters spot the lion leaving, and they follow him. And there's an intimate moment where the lion, so big and fearless, is heavy-hearted, and he says, put your hands into my mane and walk with me. Walk with me. So the girls do. Eventually, they come to a point where he says, you must stay here. Staying there, they watch and they sneak behind and look through brambles and thickets watching the lion as he walks closer and closer to this mass of people. It's the most unseemly gathering of monsters and creatures and things you could imagine around a bonfire and a great gray stone table. And the lion walks up and with one swipe of his paw, he could have cleaned him out. But when the witch says, bind him, they bound him and he fought not. They laid him on the stone table. They shaved him. They tortured him. They caused him great agony and suffering. And the queen eventually over a tortured, broken Aslan plunges the knife into him. Thinking she had won. Her victory. Her greatest victory. During this moment where the lion lay dead, her minions and the evil creatures begin to dance in a foaming, reveling kind of crazy roar. They're thrilled. Their arch enemy is dead. Their plan has succeeded. The great lion is dead, and the queen's grip remains forever. Or does it? Oh, don't you want to stay there for a minute? You're like, what? You can't end there. You got to join me. You got to join me now in a scripture, and I want you to hold on to that story, okay? Hold on to it with me. But I want you to read something because there's a hidden mystery that takes place in what we're about to read where maybe you've walked past this as many times as I have and now we get to kind of engage it on God's terms, not through our side. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 3, 8 to 19. Paul writing, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles, uh, that remember that's us, all of us who are outside of the Abraham bloodline, the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past 
was kept hidden in God. It was hidden in God. Who created all things? Catch verse 10 with me. This is really, really important. God, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. See, we're good with rulers and authorities, but we don't always think of the heavenlies, that there is a Satan, that there are demonic and angelic forces in the world. And it was his intent, God's intent, that he would use the church to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And it was according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I, Paul, kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What is Paul saying? I think Paul is making very clear a trait of God. Paul is making very clear a trait of God that we don't think about a lot. But he's using language here that would unfold for us a mystery. Let's do this. Let's make a bit of a Narnia sandwich, and we'll put the scripture between them. See, Aslan walking to the queen walked into a situation that those girls thought, oh no, or maybe he's going to fight them and win the battle. And he walked into it and then was bound willingly, tortured willingly, killed willingly. Because Aslan understood, as Lewis wrote, the deeper magic. It was beyond the queen's leadership possibilities. It was beyond the reach of her spies and her gathering of knowledge. The deep magic was, as Paul would say, hidden in God. And what happens is the next morning, the dew is heavy on the ground. The big cat lies on the stone table. The girls are asleep under a bush and a great crack is heard. Pop. And they sit up and they look and they go, oh my goodness, they took his body. They took the lion's body. Why not just leave him be? But suddenly the golden sun crests over Narnia. Light sheds and a roar shakes the earth at its foundations. And it's Aslan fully alive. What was once dead under the burden of Edmund's sin was now fully alive. And Paul's revealing something true in this scripture that we see in Aslan's story. Because dying for Edmund had been the very thing that broke the power, the dark magic that was held over the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. And now Narnia was free in him. A great war would still be fought if you read the books. But Narnia was free because he had done what? He had absorbed the guilt he didn't deserve, and he had conquered death. What Paul is saying in this today to you and I is similar to what Lewis said in that story, that Christ's death reveals to us this term we don't use often, the omniscience, the all-knowingness of God. God knows all. God sees all. God is not limited by our finite minds. When I hear an atheist say, well, I can't conceive of a God like that, I'm like, aren't you glad you're not him? How scary to think that our minds, because we can't understand God, won't believe. God is greater. God is all-knowing. God sees plans before they come into power. God is Lord over rulers and authorities. God's omniscience 
means this, that he alone knows, is, and is powerful over all things. And that means not only the rulers and authorities on this earth, but the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. I believe in the spirit world. I believe firmly in it. I believe there's a devil. Jesus talked about him a lot. I believe there's a hell. Jesus talked about it a lot. The reason I believe is because I know this. When Paul writes words like this, that his intent, God's intent, was that he would use the church to become the manifold wisdom of God and reveal through the church this wisdom of God to the heavenly realms tells me that God always had a plan and that the rulers and authorities are subject to God, not him to them. So here's what I delight in. I delight to think that that night when the great lion walked towards the witch, she was about to win in her mind. She had crafted a plan that would kill the great lion. Do you see the parallels between the lion and Jesus, known as the lion of the tribe of Judah? Do you see the parallels? Can you see how evil rejoiced the day that Jesus Christ was betrayed? Can you imagine with me the plan of God and that it was unknown to evil? Evil thought it was winning the day that Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, abandoned by all but one of them, to die and suffer alone on the cross? Can you imagine the frothing, foaming glee of the evil that gathered around and thought they had won, not knowing that they were unwittingly participant in God's plan for redeeming creation because they couldn't see it, but God had a plan. God had a plan in Christ Jesus. Satan thought he could turn people from Jesus. Remember, Jesus, the night, the week before he was crucified, came into Jerusalem to the cries, Hosanna, our king is here. They loved him. Five days later, they screamed, crucify him. Satan thought he won. His plan was coming together. He thought he had the edge, but God knew better. God had a bigger plan than Satan could conceive of. So in killing the Lord Jesus Christ, with our sin on his back, Satan thought he won. And I can't imagine the groan from hell itself when Christ came up out of the grave. But I can scarcely imagine the shock and horror when he sent the Holy Spirit to invade his church. And they went, well, now there's like a billion of them. What do we do with them redeemed in Christ? God's plan was greater than the immediate satisfaction of Satan. We need to understand that no one could have guessed that he would send his son to die for our sins. I don't think hell, the demons, and Satan himself ever thought that was the plan. I think they thought they won. But Paul says he was going to make known to us, to the world, to the heavenly realms, God's wisdom. He was going to use us in the process. He was going to redeem us through Christ Jesus, fill us with his spirit, and reveal to them the fullness of his plan. He was going to do to them what they couldn't understand, which tells us a couple things true of God. First of all, the love of God surpasses knowledge. Love that surpasses knowledge matters. We are in an age post-enlightenment where we are people of reason, thought, and logic. Most scientists will tell you that science is a guessing game. You get far more wrong than you get right. Not because you're bad at science, but because science is reaching into the unknown and hypothesizing, guessing. Stephen Hawking guesses, and it's an educated guess most of the time. It's very intelligent. It's subservient to God. We need to understand that knowledge, though good, isn't the end. I love how C.S. Lewis so wisely wrote into the Chronicles of Narnia how the birds and the trees and the beasts of Narnia would betray people because they were spies for the queen. If love surpasses knowledge, then spies don't matter. It doesn't matter who's against you. It matters who's for you. The enemy, Satan, and the world around us does not understand Not only do they not understand, they completely reject the love of God because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in their plan. 
they cannot see it. But for you and I, we recognize that in meeting Christ, we have gotten to see something true of God. We get to see his all-consuming, loving, reckless, passionate heart for us. We get to see those things in and through him. And what blows my mind in this is there's an unexplainable peace and love that fills Christians worldwide when they come to know the love of God. And it sustains them through trials, pain, and hardships, which we all have. And they say, why are you at peace in that struggle? Why are you at peace? Because we know the God who is Lord over our circumstances. It doesn't make our circumstance less real. It just makes us lean into the one whom we trust. There was a girl. They think she was 16 or 17. It was during the 1970s when the Iron Curtain, if you're old enough to remember the Iron Curtain of Russia, the Soviet Union, when it was at its thickest and most staunch, there was a girl meeting in a home church with a number of other believers in Soviet Russia, down in kind of towards the, um, the Chinese border. And Soviet soldiers came into the house brandishing weapons. They took the pastor's Bible, they threw it on the, the ground, and they said to them, spit on that book and you can live. Reluctantly, some people did. They just wanted to live. But one 16 to 17-year-old girl walked up to the Bible She took her dress and she wiped it. And she said, Father, forgive them. They're scared and don't know what to do. And she gave her life in that moment to the cause of Christ. All those people who had betrayed Christ saw courage, peace, and hope that goes beyond this life. See, the reality is, how how does a 16-year-old girl have that much courage in the face of Soviet soldiers with a pistol in their hand? She sees God clearly. She not only knows him, but she's experienced him. And she realizes his word and his community and the truth of God is more valuable than the life she has. And she must live faithfully in great trials. So here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to apply this because love that surpasses knowledge matters. I want you to know God. I want you to make him known, but I do believe this. We should know the right things about God, but then we should believe them in the way that we live. We should live them out. So here's what I would like to do in applying this. I want to remind you and have you let this rotate in your head. God knows all. That's your first application. Remind yourself, God knows all, but the enemy doesn't. The enemy of your soul doesn't know everything. He doesn't know God's plan for your life. He's trying to interrupt and disrupt your Christian witness and faith. But the enemy is as ignorant of God's plans as the witch was in the story of Aslan. They think they're succeeding. But God, remember, out of ashes he creates beauty. Out of brokenness he communicates the gospel. The God we serve and love in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God our Father knows all. And the enemy of your soul does not, regardless of circumstance. Trust the God who sees big. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I would guarantee there's a lot of hands that would go up if we were so brave. If I said, who here is facing a circumstance that they feel is bigger than them? Who'd be like, oh man, it's me. Trust in a God who sees bigger and quit believing that the enemy of your soul has any authority. He is bound and broken under the blood and cross of Christ. We are called to live in Christ's power, not bound by the lie that the enemy knows anything true of us. His lies are broken under the power of the cross. So understand, remind yourself, God knows all and the enemy doesn't. The second thing is remind yourself that his love still surpasses knowledge. Sometimes his plans lead you through circumstances that make no sense. They make no sense. You're like, God, why would this happen? Why would you break my heart? Why would you wreck me? Why would you harm me? And you have all these questions because you and I see small. We're bound by our circumstances. God is not. But the inner knowledge, if we can hold on to the truth and the belief that God's love is for us, we will begin to live differently amid our circumstances. 
His Holy Spirit will enable you to live as a bright witness to him amid your circumstances. You can't do it in your own power. When I hear people say, "Uh, Eric, I can't, I'm like, oh, sweet, you know it then. Because neither can I. But he can. He sent his Holy Spirit into the church. How amazing is that? That the Holy Spirit of God fills again and again the life of the believer so that we could have a love that surpasses our knowledge of our circumstances. Our circumstances pale in comparison to the high calling of Christ. Third and finally, we need to understand that our witness to the world is our ability to not be bound by circumstance, but to be forever tethered, held close by the love of God that has called us to him in Christ Jesus. Our peace and trust in God's sovereign plan, will declare to the world around us that we believe bigger than we know. I want you to hear that for me. The world will see Christ through us when they see us believing bigger than our circumstances around us. We believe bigger than we know. I don't know everything, but I know the God who gives peace in storms, purpose in success, And loves us to the point of his own son's death. That we may know, have fellowship, and make known. Not only to this world, but to the powers that think they rule it. The evil. To make known the manifold wisdom of God. That he who died for us has filled us and turned us loose to live as witnesses for him. Live bigger than your circumstances. Live in the power of him who is Lord over all. Pray with me. God, we come to you right now and we ask that you would give us wisdom in our life. And wisdom comes with the fear of the Lord. And often, God, we just don't, we don't see you correctly. We don't look at you as you are high and lifted up, almighty God. So today, we ask, would you give us a glimpse of the God who is stronger than our adversary? the God who is stronger than cancer, the God who is stronger than death, the God who is stronger than heartache, and the God who walks with us through all of them. Would you show us and reveal to us and let us experience you, Lord Jesus Christ, in your humility, in your love, and in your strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, We are going to... Yeah, you got to come up. In case you've not known, this is, um, I'm going to, I'll call her babe, and you're like, whoa, but that's, this is Erica, in case you never put those two dots together. Erica has an announcement to make um, about a small group. Okay. Super scared, so you can just look at him. Do you want them to close their <laughs> eyes? Yeah, that's okay. Just close your eyes and just, okay, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you've ever had God lay something on your heart, but several months ago, he felt like he kind of nudged me um, and then nudged me a little more. And then I would have conversations, and people would kind of bring this topic up, and I keep hitting my heart, and apparently I was really slow because he just started waking me up in the middle of the night (laughs) to remind me of this and lay it on my heart. And what it is is moms in our church um, and single moms, unmarried moms. Maybe you are a mom, but you have lost your husband. Maybe you are a mom and you are divorced. Or maybe you are a mom who is married, but your husband is unable to go to a small group, or your schedules are strange, and you you can't join a small group together, so you would like to be part of a sermon-based small group that is um, just a group of moms. And um, we kind of said Mom 24 because it's moms to moms, it's moms for moms, and it's for those moms who are moms, you know, 24-7 all the time. And we know that that requires a different kind of group, a different kind of support, but we would like to provide something that it would still be a sermon based small group, but it would be a group of moms. So regardless of your circumstance as a mom and regardless of your age as a mom, if this is something you would like to be a part of, if you could put on your connection cards, mom group or mom 24, that would be great. And we'll see who we hear from and then we'll try to put something together. Well done. Was it that scary? Yes. You can see Erica in the back parking lot afterwards, just running that way. All right. 
Um, all right, my friends, as you go from this place, I implore you to remember the enemy who desires your defeat is subservient to the all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe who has called you by his name. You are Christians. So if you in this place are called Christian, go and live as such. Go and live in the power of the name of him who has redeemed you with his own blood. If you're in here and you're like, oh, shoot, that word Christopher said, I'm, I'm not a Christian, right? Oh, my word, what do I do? Come see me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. I would love to pray with you and introduce, him, introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is living, he is risen, and he alone can atone not only for your sin, but give purpose to your life and your living. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you are dismissed.